I would love that. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Amy Trueblood and I write young adult historical fiction. Um, just to kind of show you my covers, which I love. Um, this is my debut, it's called Nothing But Sky. Um, it takes place in 1922 and it tells the story of 18 year old Grace Lafferty who is um, a wing walker. And I'm not sure if you know what that is, but it's basically, um, circus type performers that hung off wings of planes for a living, um, about 500 feet off the ground, usually no parachute. Um, in the 1920s, aviation was just brand new. They had just gone through World War I and they just started using planes for combat and things like that. So this is a Grace's story of how she's trying to keep her found family together and earn a Hollywood contract. Um, and in the midst of all of that, um, they hire a new um, uh, World War II, uh, World War One veteran uh, named by the name of Henry, and he creates all sorts of problems for Grace. So, um, so it's fun. Um, it's very exciting. It uh, has a lot of daredevil elements to it, but it also kind of tells the story of what life was like after World War One. Um, my second book, um, which came out last year, is called Across a Broken Shore. You can see that here. And um, it takes place in the 1930s while the Golden Gate Bridge is being built in San Francisco. And it is the story of 18-year-old um, Willa, whose family is very religious and they expect her to be a nun. She's the only daughter uh, with four older brothers. And she has a secret passion for medicine. And so she finds out there's a female physician practicing in her neighborhood and she sneaks off every day to assist the physician. And it just so happens the physician is also helping take care of men who are building the Golden Gate Bridge. So um, a lot of my, my stories tend to be um, forgotten stories, usually female forgotten stories. Um, women who have a place in history, but only get like a line in history, or they're barely mentioned in Wikipedia or things like that. But they, these women had extraordinary um, rever reverberations on history. And, um, and so my thing is loving to tell these forgotten women's stories. Um, a lot of times they break barriers and they um, kind of snub their noses at societal rules and that's always really fun. Plus, I don't write Mary Sue's. I write girls who are very forceful and strong, but also don't always make the greatest choices, um, which is great for building character arcs and things like that. So I like to make them very real and bring them to the page. Um, one of the things I always like to address when I uh, address classrooms is I think that there is this big belief that historical fiction is a big snooze. And about 10 years ago, I would have said that because I wasn't writing historical. Um, I was writing con YA contemporary, some adult contemporary books. And sometimes as a writer, you figure out that stories sort of find you. Um, I never meant to write historical fiction, but I stumbled upon a story of a female wing walker while I was visiting a museum in Chicago. And I think in wanting to be a writer and learning how to be a writer, the thing that always sparks creativity for me is the what if question. Um, what if this character did this? What if this character made the bad choice? What if the character made the wrong decision or picked the wrong love interest? What would that look like? And so for me, Grace's story came to me because I knew that there were these female daredevils. Um, at the time, aviation was such a big deal and everybody had heard of um, the Wright brothers, everybody knew um, all these like, famous aviators, but these women were just doing these things incredible things and, and history kind of ignored them. So I knew that they were real women in history. So I kind of delved into their past. Again, I found out there was very little written about them. And so I kind of took all these women and made them amalgamation of each of their favorite in, in you know, distinct personalities and came up with the character of Grace. Um, so I know that sometimes history can seem boring, it can seem dull. Um, a lot of times, even when I ask a room full of adults, you know, what do you think about historical fiction? A lot of times I hear not relevant, but this, I don't wanna say scary, but interesting thing that I find is the more I kind of go down research rabbit holes, I discovered that we are not so far ahead of a hundred years ago. Um, we're still 
battling the same problems and issues, um, you know, in San Francisco in 1930 that we are in, you know, the United States in, you know, the 2020s. So, um, so for me, it's always interesting to tell these stories, to place those what if ideas out in front of myself, kind of challenge myself, but also I need to figure out if I'm writing young adult because I know who my audience is. How do I make these characters challenges and troubles and journeys relevant to what's going on today? And that's really, really important to me because um, I know that, you know, teenagers, young adults, they have lots of choices when they decide to read books. And if they pick up my book, I want them to feel that they've been on a journey and I want them to feel like their time was worth it. So I try really hard to make the stories relevant, but also interesting. And as you can see from the excerpts that I showed, uh, shared with you guys, um, those are two like somewhat exciting scenes in both the books. And the reason why I picked those, um, or at least I didn't start from the beginning was, it's really important to me that as a writer, I include visceral details. So you'll find in my books, there's a lot of sight, sense, hearing, those kind of cues in my writing. That's really important to me. Um, the other thing is, is that it's really, really important to me that um, those characters feel real. Um, again, like I said, I don't, I tend to write uh, really flawed, flawed, flawed characters. And I think that what readers like to see, no matter your, your age, um, is that they can somehow identify with a characteristic or a vulnerability of the character. And I feel like if you can do that, you can reach your reader because if they're not feeling anything on the page, if they're not getting anything out of the story, I think that they're just more willing to close the book and move on to something more interesting. So my goal is always to kind of weave narrative with exciting drama and like I said, bad decisions. <laughs> so if my character's supposed to go left, most likely I'm gonna make them go right. And sometimes when you make them go right, you may go off your outline, but sometimes you find the most interesting things about your characters. So. Um, one of the things that I did want to talk, did taught, and I told your teacher about is the problem with being a historical writer is, is that it's this long, long path of doing research because there's this thing called a historical anachronism, which is you write a story in a certain time and place, but it isn't exactly historically accurate. <laughs> so for me, it's really important that even if a historian reads my book, uh, I don't get dinged in a review for saying for something that isn't wasn't right for that time frame. So I really, really work hard to make sure that my my books are historically authentic. So when I started doing the research for Nothing But Sky. I was really nervous. Like I said, I couldn't find a lot online about these women. But I had a family member at the time as I was talking to them about research and they're like, hey, have you gone on YouTube? Have you looked at anything on YouTube? And I just thought, oh, there's no way that there's gonna be anything on YouTube that I can use. Well, of course I was wrong. So I asked your teacher to share a video here with you. And this is important because this helped me write. This, this black and white video that you're about to see actually helped bring Grace's life. Um, to light for me and helped me write. I much, must have watched this video like a hundred times. And if you ever do read my book, you will notice like some of the stunts that this woman does. Her name is Lillian Boyer. She's 19 years old. This takes place in 1922. And this is real black and white footage of her actually being a wing walker. So if you'll share the video and I kind of will talk about it. Okay. All right, let's see if I can make this work. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, one moment. My uh, lost the tab. Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Okay. Okay. So, hypothetically, I should be able to share my screen. Okay. Can we, can we all see? I can see this. I can just see the black screen now. Okay. Um, okay. Can you, uh, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. We'll accept. There we go. Okay. 
All right, let's see. Um, okay. if you could just yeah, yeah, there you go. Perfect. Oh, I'm so sorry. What is going on? It's okay. There we go. So as you can see, it's, it's kind of going strangely here, but this is actually Lillian Boyer in 1922. She actually hung off the wing of a plane. Um, and as you can see, the, she's hanging off the fly, flying wires, which I, I kind of shared with you guys in the, my excerpt. She hung by the bottom of the plane. And I don't know if you guys can see when they show her close up, but she's wearing a sweater, a pair of white kids, um, a pair of pants, and she's not wearing a parachute. So all of this is done. This was actually film taken, I believe in Chicago or no, I'm sorry, Michigan. And this is her actually hanging off the plane 500 feet above the ground doing her own show. The last trick, this is her on top of the wing, no parachute, doing an inverted loop. Um, basically gravity is keeping her in place. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I had to look at for research. And to tell Grace's story, I studied this video again and again and again. And this was very helpful because I had to figure out how on the page I was going to tell Grace's story, but it also give the reader a vivid, vivid picture of what Grace was actually doing in the air. So um, you can stop sh screen sharing now. I think you kind of, <laughs> you get the idea of, of kind of uh, Lillian's bravery here. Um, a lot of times when I show that video, the first thing somebody asks is, so does Lillian live? And actually Lillian lived a really good life. Um, she performed until her late 20s. She got married, she moved to California, and she actually lived until her late, uh, till her mid 80s. So, um, so she had a great life. Um, I actually, as part of the oral history from the um, Space and Science Museum in San Diego, she gave like three hour interview um, just a month, few months before her death. Um, she had celebrated her, I think, 82nd birthday, and um, she, somebody had actually taken her back up in a plane for her birthday. But the pilot made her promise that she would stay in the seat this time and not climb out on the wings. And she jokingly said she couldn't make that promise. So even at 82, uh, Lillian was quite the daredevil, and she was was awesome. So research itself is a critical part of what I mentioned before telling this story, this what if story. And for me, Grace's what if story was, what if the, her livelihood, what, what if what made her Grace was suddenly threatened? Um, not only by um, a competing act that comes to town with a pretty devilish um, leader of the act who, who kind of haunts her life a little bit, but also um, at the time, aviators who were turning from um, World War I had basically bought planes and were doing these flying circuses unlicensed. Um, there wasn't a federal aviation commission at the time. And so they were doing a lot of really risky things. And so um, a few years later, they actually shut down these kinds of acts because they were taking so many risks that they were crashing, they were killing people on the ground. It was, it was pretty dangerous. So I kind of used that um, conflict to also add pressure to Grace and to have her maybe take more risks, not do some smart things because at the time they were trying to earn money to get to Chicago so that they could compete for a Hollywood contract. And in her life, a Hollywood contract meant regular pay, a regular place to live. They weren't sleeping on the ground in between shows when they were traveling you know, throughout the Midwest and things like that. So external conflict here was important as well as internal conflict. And, and internal conflict for, for Grace was, is that Grace lives with her uncle Warren and she lost both her parents and her sister to the Spanish flu, which was happened in 1918, which again, we were talking about relevance. The Spanish flu in 1918, our pandemic in 2020. And frighteningly enough, I had to do a lot of research about the Spanish flu and it only really only appears in like one chapter of the book. But having that knowledge made this oncoming pandemic pretty interesting for me because I knew what the country had gone through in 1918 and it was 
eerie how similar things were replicated in 2020. So again, relevance. Um, you think something 100 years ago isn't relevant and then boom, it's relevant again. So um, moving on to Across a Broken Shore, um, again, between Nothing But Sky and Across a Broken Shore, I wrote two other books. Um, and then um, my publisher came to me and said, we want you to try another historical book. What do you have for us? And I was like, yeah, I got nothing. Um, so one day I was scrolling through Twitter and uh, I follow this account called History and Pictures and the picture of the bridge came up, the Golden Gate Bridge. And I was like, huh, I never read a 1930s YA book. That would be an interesting time period to tell. It was a time after World War I, but before World War II um, and right after the Great Depression. That that would be super interesting to tell, but I didn't really have a story to tell. So um, I, <laughs> I started scrolling some more and I, I'm a big believer in fates and, and things kind of fall out in the way they should be. And a couple of minutes later, another picture flashed up from history and pictures. And it was of a woman named Lucy Wanzer, who was the first woman west of the Rockies to earn her medical degree in 1876 and so I was like oh there's a story here there's a story here so I learned about Lucy and you I didn't want to work in that time period but I thought how can I incorporate Lucy's story into this 1930s book that I wanted to write and it just so happened that as I did more research about Lucy she had more than at least a line in a Wikipedia page but if you name I mean everybody knows who Elizabeth Blackwell is or if you say that within historical circles she was the first woman in the United States to get her medical license but um, Lucy was the first one on the west coast we west of the Rockies um, so her story is very interesting but what really helped me is is that she practiced in San Francisco until 1930. She actually helped build the first women and children's hospital in San Francisco. And I thought, oh, she can't be my character, but she can be a mentor. So in the book, uh, Dr. Catherine Winston, who is Willa's mentor, is actually kind of um, a symbolic um, Lucy Wanzer. Um, and that was really fun because I got to take a lot of the things that happened to Lucy when she was in medical school. She actually applied twice to the University of California, San Francisco Medical School. It wasn't called that at the time, it was called Tolan Medical College. Um, but she was rejected twice. She fought it both times and eventually they went back through the school's charter and found that they could not on legal grounds deny her entrance based on her sex. And so she begrudgingly was admitted. It was her and I believe a class of 20 young men. So she was much older than all of them. I think she was in her early thirties when she actually started and they hazed her badly. They really badly. And um, and one of her professors she had a run in with, and there's this, this actually part in the book where he kind of basically gives her a jive about how she really should actually be home, you know, raising children. And she gives him a pretty good jive back, which is really amazing for 1876 that this woman would do that. But what ended up happening was, and it usually happens, is the men in the medical school, they played a prank on another guy. And basically they, they got him, they just, they basically got him in the morgue alone and he was afraid and scared and Lucy kind of came and saved him. But then the professors at the school found out about it. And so they brought everybody in and said, confess. And Lucy kept their secret. Lucy didn't, didn't rat on any of them. And so instantly she became kind of one of the boys and they ended up, by the time she graduated, they were all going to her for medical help and advice and homework advice and all that kind of stuff. So she kind of in the end had, you know, the upper hand with all of them, but she went through a lot. So again, even in today's society, we're still kind of seeing these, these women banging their head against the glass ceiling. And, you know, all these women who came before us, you know, kind of tried to pave the road for us, but we're still struggling. But the great thing about Lucy is, is, is that once she graduated, the professor saw that women could handle the studies. They could see that the women could handle the rigor. And so after Lucy graduated, they continually up until World War II had of at least five, six, seven women that they admitted to the medical class. And that was in 1876, 1880s, 1890s. Here's a shocker. 
Harvard Medical School did not admit women until 1945. So, so you can tell why I love these stories because these women, they were forerunners, they were, you know, warriors. And so I continually want to tell these stories. And the cool thing about the research part of it is, is the more you learn about these women, the more you learn about the conditions that they had to endure. I want to go back to what I talked about earlier. The more you have a story, you have a story to tell. And no matter what category, adult, young adult, middle grade, picture book, whatever story you want to tell, you have to have that nugget of an idea there. You have to, whether you're going to create a fantasy world, whether you're going to write a sci-fi world, whether you're going to write a, a, a you know, romantic contemporary, you still have to world build. And I think that that is something that people don't think about. Um, I have lots of really, really good friends who write YA fantasy and I'm always blown away at how creative they are. Like I wanna climb inside my friends who write YA fantasy sometimes and just be like, how do you do that? How do you build that world? And they look at me like I'm insane. They're like, well, how do you do it with historical? That's crazy. And the truth is, is that it's there but you still have to build it because you forget what that time is like. So like for me, I have to be super careful when I use dialogue because I may want to say something like I really, really, really wanted Grace to curse in one part of the book, <laughs> but I couldn't because back then, first of all, that wasn't okay for women. And second of all, you know, there, the language wasn't really as wasn't really there. Same thing in the 1930s with Willa. So you have to figure out how you show on the page through dialogue, through action, through body language, how frustrated and angry that character is. And that really brings its own challenges. So while my friends are building these elaborate crazy worlds and they're having these really cool maps built of these worlds that they're, they're creating, I'm trying to figure out how I can use a certain piece of language or I have to go you know, online and look up the etymology of a word to figure out whether or not it was actually used in the 1920s or the 1930s. And I actually had to change a word in Nothing But Sky because my book took place in 1922, but it didn't come part of the American vernacular until the middle mid thirties. <laughs> so I had a copywriter be like, a copy editor be like, you can't use that word. And I was like, oh. So I tried to find like every single kind of comparable word, but every word that I tried to use um, for that word. And by the way, that word was pizzazz. It was not, it was not actually coined by Coco Chanel until the early thirties. So I couldn't, <laughs> so I couldn't use it. So it's, it's writing historical can be super frustrating because sometimes you just want to say what you want to say um, in, in modern language. You can't. So that's always really wild too, but I know that we're talking about writing and, and the realities of what it's like to be a read writer. Um, so I would love to open the floor to questions that you may have about writing, um, anything you have about um, my process or any questions you have about, um, I'm very open to talk about how publishing in general works, how you get an agent, how you sell a book, um, how that whole process works, um, contracts, I mean, whatever question you may have about publishing, I'm very open to answering questions. So if anybody has a question, shoot them my way. Yeah. You guys feel free to unmute and ask a question if you'd like. You can also put it in the chat um, and I'm, I'm happy to read it for you as well. I'll give you, okay. give them a minute to, okay. <laughs> to do that. Um, in the meantime, though, while we're doing that, if you guys are coming up with questions, I wanted to just show you some, some really cool things. So first of all, um, I know you probably will think this is wild, but um, Etsy has actually saved my life when it comes to research. Um, Etsy has the most amazing antique bookshops. <laughs> so I was trying to figure out how to use medical terms in, 19, in the 1930s um, and what would have been um, the, the right way to set an arm and do set certain things like that. And I actually found on Etsy um, some American Red Cross um, books from that were printed in the 19 in 1930. And those were actually like my go to books for when I was talking about medicine or anything at all. Um, I went down a research rabbit hole about stitches, and what kind of thread they actually had to use in the 1930s to do stitches. Um, you have to remember, this is um, a, a way before um, penicillin and things like that were really vastly used. So 
interesting things like that where I was trying to figure out and it's weird I know but Etsy is the great place for that um the other thing that I, I discovered was um and I don't know if you guys are going to be able to see this I'm going to try to hold it up to the screen here but this is actually a schematic of a 1920s biplane and so when I was writing all the details for Grace's tricks and stunts I had to very much familiarize myself with not only how a biplane looked and what its parts were but how she could move across the tops of the wings and across the wires um, and so that was really interesting um, and then for um, Across a Broken Shore, I wanted to show you guys this. Um, I actually worked hand in hand with a historian in San Francisco who actually grew up in the neighborhood that Willa grows up in the book that I share in the book. And so he was really helpful, but he, um, he's in his late seventies. He's a great guy, really nice. He knows everything about San Francisco you could know. So I actually sent him the book twice. And he looked at it before my editors even did because I didn't want to send it with it having some historical boo-boos or things in it that were wrong. So I got pages and pages of notes from him from where I'd really gone off or done things wrong. But he did a great thing for me. He did research and he actually sent me, and you guys see this here. And I don't know if you can see that. It says the Golden Gate Bridge. This is actually the only about 100 of these were printed. And this is actually the report from the lead engineers um, that takes you from the first day of the building and the bridge to the last day of building the bridge. And it details like what was done each day and all the problems and stuff like that. And that is like an antique book. And he gave, he gifted that to me. And that really helped me with my research. So sometimes you got to dive real deep and, and figure out how you're going to tell your story because you, you want to get the details right. So I think I saw a question pop up. Yes, Gretel asked do, whether you have any tips on how to find an agent. Okay, um, the agent thing is very interesting and I will tell you my methodology for that. Um, I'm actually on my second agent. Um, I have friends who are on their third and fourth agent. It's really normal because as you grow as a writer and as things change within literary agencies, sometimes you outgrow each other. Um, sometimes your agent will stop repping what you rep. Like I have a friend who's looking for a new agent because her agent stopped um, repping young adult and is only doing adult now. So some of those things happen. That's just a normal, ever-changing part of the business. Um, but if you want to find an agent, um, what I suggest is you be very organized about it. Um, start a spreadsheet. Um, and then you want to go online and you want to go, um, there's this place called Query Tracker. And some elements of, elements of it are paid, some elements are free. And you can go into Query Tracker and it will, you can kind of drill down and it will tell you like what agents rep YA, then what agents rep YA fantasy or whatever. And you have to be very diligent about doing your homework. Because what will happen is, is if you just kind of say, oh, I like this agent or, oh, hey, I saw that agent's name back in the end of acknowledgements, a couple of things can happen. First is they may not rep whatever you're writing. So they may not rep YA fantasy. Um, so you need to make sure that they're doing that. The second thing is, is that you need to make sure that if you're interested that you go to their actual website for their agency because a lot of times agents who are fairly well known or really well respected and will close to queries um, because they have a really heavy workload. And so they may only open to queries in a certain time period. And then once you do your homework and you find maybe like 50 agents that you would like to send your work to, what you want to do then is go, again, go to their submission policies make sure that you're following them to the T because the first thing that will happen is, is if you're not following the guidelines for what they want, they'll just immediately delete your email. So you wanna follow the rules. And I'm telling you right now, I have done an agent series on my blog for a really long time where I've interviewed agents and they have told me that if you just follow with their rules, you will rise to the top of their slush pile because it was, it's unbelievable the num number of queries they get where people just don't follow the submission requirements and they immediately delete them. So you're already halfway ahead of the game if you just figure out what their submission policies are and you do that. And then my next piece of advice is once you do that, and I know you don't like, probably like homework and spreadsheets, but build yourself a spreadsheet in Excel, just basic. The name of the agent, what their email address is, 
um, what their submission requirements are and then make yourself a date for when you submitted and then a date for when, when you got a response, uh, whether it's a rejection or it's a request for more materials. And I know it sounds weird, but if you start querying 10 agents and you get five rejections and then you query 10 more, you kind of get in a jumble and you can't remember who you sent what to. And that becomes an issue because um, if you get an offer, which I hope you will, um, you are, um, it, it, it's common courtesy um, to reach out to that agent and let them know that you have an offer just so that they can either turn around and read quickly for you or they can just politely say good luck and move on. And then you can kind of just uh, cross that person off your list. But half of this is just doing research, doing your homework, and just submitting what they ask for and making sure that what you submit, they actually rep. And I know that was really long, <laughs> sorry, but I'd like to give as much detail as possible because I think if you're armed with information, you have a much better chance of success. Do we have another question? Oh, come on. You have to have some question about rejection. How many rejections I had before I actually... <laughs> <laughs> Before I actually got an agent, I mean, it's you have to kind of have a thick skin in this business. It's hard to it's hard to share your intimate work and your love of words with somebody and have them say no. <laughs> it happens a lot, and it even happens to published authors. It happens where you can sell two books in a row and then you can't sell another book for a year, or two years, and things like that. So it's it's very up and down business. So, um, but I wouldn't do it. For, I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean. If you think about it, being a writer is kind of like being a magician or being like a wizard. I mean, how many people do you know can have a story in their head and put it on the page and bring something that out of nothing to life? I mean, that's pretty magical. So I always jokingly joke with my friends. Um, there are a lot of local um, Arizona um, young adult and middle grade authors that um, I know and I meet with and I'm friends with. And we always joke around that, you know, we all kind of have a little bit of Hermione or Harry Potter in us because of, you know, being able to, to bring stories to life, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, so um, does anybody have any questions about the um, excerpts, excerpts that I shared? Um, I think that I think Izzy had a question. Oh, okay. Um, how hard would you say it was to like get your books personally out there? Like just, you know, get them out into the world and how do you, how do you do that? Are you talking about like selling a book or are you talking about like promoting a book? I guess promoting? Yeah. Um, it's weird because with the onset of social media, a lot of the onus for responsibility for getting word out about your book has, has fell on the author's shoulders. So you have to figure out as an author, what platform, what medium you're gonna to use to kind of help spread the word. Um, and so I actually started um, in advertising. I worked in PR and advertising for a really long time. Um, so I kind of had already had a baseline, which is really lucky um, to know and understand how promotion and marketing works. A lot of authors don't though. Um, but what I did was I really tried to drill down and find the places where I could find my audience. So I went on a log of um, young adult podcasts. Um, I did a, a couple of storygram tours on Instagram. I worked with a lot of bookstagrammers um, to get the word out. Um, I did interviews with um, booktubers. Um, I just really kind of tried to narrow my focus on where my audience was and how I could reach out to them and tell them about my book um, and share detail with them about my book. Um, one of the other things that was really great was um, I happened to get in contact with, and luckily enough with my publisher, I got to go to some great conferences. So I connected with a lot of booksellers and I connected with a lot of librarians. And in fact, a librarian that I met before Across the Broken Shore came out submitted my book to the American Library Association's Amelia Bloomer list, which is a, week, a yearly list where they vote on the best feminist books in children's books. And so Across the Broken Shore was selected. So that's an actually a really cool honor, but that would have never happened for me had I not met that librarian at that event. So you really have to figure out 
how you're going to reach your audience. If you're an adult author, this conversation is much different. If you're a middle grade author, it's much different because you're talking to parents. You're talking to the parents because they're the predominant buyers. And so you're talking to parents and you're talking to teachers. So with each category, it's kind of different. And why I, why a, I always kind of like to call the wild, wild west because anything is possible. So one day before I have a book coming out, I might do a podcast, then I might do an interview with Nerd Daily or BuzzFeed. And then I might also like answer you know, five or six blog questions from YA book bloggers. So it's it's just narrowing down your focus and figuring out how you can promote your book to your specific audience. I hope that helps. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Anybody other have any questions? Um, the one thing I was mentioning beforehand is that I was talking about the excerpts that I sent and shared. And so um, I think you, if you guys read those, do you guys have any questions just about craft or about how, um, how, how writing actually works or how difficult it is to write specific scenes? Did you guys want to talk anything about writing craft? If we have some writers here. Well, these are all writers and they are all oh, good. writers. Oh, good. Yep. This, is a, <laughs> this is a creative writing class and they've. Okay, great. I, I did, for some reason, I thought it was an English class, but it's a creative writing class. So yeah. So you guys hit me some questions with some questions about craft. I mean, one of the things I think that's most difficult is, is the actual learning how to improve your craft. And really the best way you can do that is through reading and writing. And so even now, when I fast draft, when I write first drafts, it's terrible. I mean, first drafts that nobody ever sees, but you have to kind of get that story out of your head and on the page. So if I can leave you with anything today, it's that first draft, you should not be hard on yourself. That is meant to be the, I mean, for lack of a better term, that that's literally like just grabbing those ideas out of your head and putting them on the page. Um, some of my friends call it word vomiting, but just basically getting the story out of your head and on the page. Um, and, and that first draft is not, and that's not what's going to be published. That's not what your friends are really going to read. That's not what your teachers are going to read. Everything needs revision. Everything needs editing. Everything needs polishing. So it, again, if I can leave you with anything today is, is don't be afraid of that first draft. Don't be afraid of letting that first draft be really messy and really ugly. As long as you can get the story out, because as, as I, as Anne Lamont said, you cannot edit a blank page. And that's something to really remember. So you've got to get the words down, um, even if they're ugly and yucky and not really what you want to say, but you're kind of trying to get your idea across, um, get those words out. Um, that's the most important thing. But did anybody have a question just about how to write a sticky scene or how to make your characters make bad choices, anything like that? We've got one. We've got one okay. here. Um, do you write your stories in the order of the chapters or are you someone who pops around? Do you outline or do you kind of free write? I wish I, I have a very linear brain. <laughs> um, I did not do well in math in school. I'm going to be honest. Um, I have a very linear brain. So I outline in chapter by chapter. Um, I write a small little pitch for each chapter. I know what I want to do in each chapter. Um, but I'm what I affectionately call a planter, which means I plot, but I also pants, which means I don't rigidly adhere to what I outline. If something comes to me or a part of a backstory feels right for a character that I haven't actually planned out before, I will put that on the page. But I think that you, you have to work with whatever you feel comfortable with. I think you have to write however the story comes to you and, and outline as you need to and pants it as you need to um, and, and really do the best that you can to get this story out on the page. Um, I will be honest with nothing but Sky, I pants that whole first draft and it was terrible. I mean, it was so bad. I didn't even know what story it was telling. And it took a lot of rewrites um, from like the beginning to the end, like chapter one to chapter 30 um, for me to, you know, over and over again. And then I had to write it over again for my agent. And then I had to rewrite it over again for the editor. So it seems like you're continuously working and writing and revising, but I wouldn't give that up for anything because 
every time I write a new book, I feel like my writing craft has improved. And I think that has only come because of the fact that I keep at it and I keep working at it. And I still, I still read craft books. I still, um, I, I'm very much devoted to what is called the emotional thesaurus. I don't know if you guys know what that is. Um, it's written by Angela Ackerman, but it is basically 30 different ways to say your character is angry, 30 different ways to show emotion if your character is um, overwrought or sad or angry or anything like that. I mean, that that book, and there are like five or six books in the series that that help you kind of not say my character is angry. It gives you great alternatives to how you can express emotion in your characters. Because I think one of the biggest things in craft that comes about it, and I think that you guys will notice that in, and I did this specifically in the excerpts I showed, is as a writer, you have to keep the reader engaged in the scene. And in order to do that, you have to have that person actually feel like maybe they're watching it as a movie in their head. Like when I write scenes, I see that as like a movie in my head. Like those characters are moving and they're, uh, I know exactly where they are on the floor in a ballroom, you know, in a field, I know all of that. Um, but your job as a writer is to keep the reader in the head of the main character. But things like words, like telling words like watched, saw, heard, um, felt, those things are all what we consider telling verbs. And those are things that pull the reader right out of the narrative. Oh, I'm reading a book. Oh, this is a character in a book. And you want your story to be an immersive experience. So you have to learn how to get around those telling verbs. So for example, I love to use examples because I think you can say the words, but until you hear an example, you probably have a better understanding, or at least I do. If you say, um, something like, um, I saw the sky it was blue and had clouds. That's great. But if you say um, something to the effect of pillowy like clouds flew over, over a deep blue sky, you're, you're telling, you're immersing the reader without saying I saw. You're describing and using the visceral reactions and the things around the character without actually telling them that you're seeing it. So you're actually in the character's head and you're seeing that actual thing. And if you can learn one thing, if you can walk away from this today, learning anything, I hope it's that you can figure out how to structure and rewrite sentences to keep, in, keep the reader inside the character's heads. And I will tell you to this day, and um, the book I'm working on now is another YA historical fiction book. And I find myself still using words like felt and see and heard and all that kind of stuff. And I let myself use those, those bad word choices. I mean, um, uh, in the first draft, because I'm just trying to get through it. But I know, and I will flag in my draft, I will go back and I'll be like, write this better. I'll leave myself really helpful notes. This doesn't work. Write it better. Yeah, I know that helps. But those are cues to me that I know that I need to go back in and I need to immerse the reader in what the character is actually going through. Um, and that's, that's really important. So there's two, if you want to, those go back and look and read those two excerpts that I left for you guys. I did that specifically because one, um, in the Across a Broken Shore, dialogue is super important and backstory is a little bit of that narrative weaved into what I shared, but it also, I hope, gets you inside Willa's head and gets you feeling what she's feeling and what she's seeing without ever telling you, this is what she's seeing, this is what she's feeling. And that's half the struggle with being a writer is figuring out how to tell the reader that without actually telling the reader that. It's hard, it's really hard and I still struggle with it. And I know writers who, be, who have 20 books out who still struggle with that, so. Um, it's, it's a good skill to work on continuously. Any other questions? What do you think guys? I think we got time for maybe one or two other questions before we, uh, before we finish up, but I, I do love that the showing versus telling. It yeah. And you know, it does, but you know, it's, it's, I don't like it when people say show, don't tell, because that's, that's not helpful. That, that does, that doesn't tell you anything. I love to show you on the page. I want to, you know, I, when I teach, I have taught some um, uh, writing uh, young adult fiction classes in libraries, like to adults and things like that, and to kids too, teenagers too. And one of the things is always, you know, how do you show that emotion without telling the reader that you're showing that emotion? And that's always the hardest thing. But I think 
I often use examples so that the reader or the writer can see what I mean by it rather than just using that throw off line show don't tell because that doesn't really help you you need concrete examples to understand what that means mm -hmm. yeah do we have one or two final questions folks I, uh, Izzy did you have one I see you're um you're unmuted yeah um I've noticed personally when I'm trying to write a draft that I tend to go back to one spot of my stories and it's always, I'm rewriting it and rewriting it to a point where I don't know which would be the best draft for the story and how mm -hmm. to outline that. So do you have any advice on that? Um, I, I, when you keep coming back and, and this is just personally for me, but I've heard that this from other authors too. When you keep going back to something in a scene, um, it's, it's, I think your internal, your internal instincts telling you there's something about that scene that's not working. There's something about it that's bothering you or so for some reason it doesn't feel right for the narrative. So what I always do in those cases, I'm struggling with the scene right now in, in this first draft that I'm writing. Um, it's a book that I'm writing on proposal that I'm hoping to sell just from like the first five chapters. And so for me, it's, it's really critical that I get that opening narrative right. And what I find is that I stumble on things that just aren't working, either for the character arc or the narrative. So what I find myself doing is flagging that. Like if you work in track changes in Word, you can flag it and then just keep writing, keep writing, keep writing. And sometimes when you get to the end of the story, you can look back and say, oh, I get why that didn't work now. That wasn't, that wasn't the direction I wanted the character in. That's not the tone I wanted the character to take. But don't let scenes that are troubling you hold you up from telling the story. You can just write them there now as a place marker and just flag it for yourself and then come back to it. It shouldn't, uh, hopefully it shouldn't keep you from moving forward with the story. Did that answer your question? I hope that's helpful. Thank you. That's sure. Any other questions about writing craft or publishing? How querying works? How selling a book works? How submitting a book works? I'm happy to answer. One last question. <laughs> now we've, we've heard a little bit about querying books from some of our other authors. Yep. Um, at least one of them talked to us about independent publishing as well. Mm -hmm. So we've got a, a little bit of background there. Sure, sure. And the submitting process is just as challenging because I mean, <laughs> as a writer, you're used to telling the story, but once you get to submitting it to editors, it becomes a totally another thing because then your agents kind of are steering the ship and all you can do is sit and wait and hope you get an email. <laughs> so it's kind of like the querying process and just as frustrating. So, um, you know, it's, it's, the joke is it's always hurry up and wait. But one thing I will say is, is that if you all are lucky enough and, and I'm sure you all are brilliant enough to get an agent one day, um, my best piece of advice for you is when you are submitting your book um, is to always have something else you're working on. Always be thinking and looking forward because there's never a guarantee that the, even if you get an agent with that book, that that book's going to sell. So when you're talking to an agent on a call, like before they're going to offer, they're gonna ask you specifically, what else are you working on? And they wanna know that you're thinking forward. You're not thinking about this book. You're not thinking of yourself as a single single book author. You're thinking as, as a career, as an author. And so you always have to be forward facing, always thinking about, okay, that book's done. What am I gonna work on next? What am I doing next? What do I see myself writing next? And, and if you don't do this already, um, always keep like a little notes open on your phone. And when an idea comes to you, just jot down that line or jot down that idea because when you're ready for it, you can go back to those notes and reflect and maybe get a nugget of a next story and things like that. So, but, but my advice is always to, even if you've gotten an agent, even if you sold a book, you should still always be thinking about the path ahead and what's next and what you want to write next. Plus it's a good distraction because then you won't be, you know, <laughs> you won't be refreshing your email every two seconds. So it's a good thing to do. <laughs> Very true. Well, guys, listen, if you, um, if we don't have any last questions, I think that might be a great place to end on. Sure. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We, I mean, we have been really treasuring these author visits um, more so this year, I think, than any other, because 
Yeah. Oh, we, sure. Yes. And you know, uh, um, your teacher has my email. So if you have any other questions about writing or about publishing, I am more than happy to answer anything. So um, you're more than welcome to share my email, Miss Frederick. And if anybody wants to send me a question, if you weren't comfortable asking it um, mm -hmm. during the Zoom, but you have a specific question you want to ask about writing craft or publishing, I'm always happy to respond and answer. So that's always open to you all too. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome. You guys have a great day.